There's no doubt that we are facing exponential impacts of climate change. If you're not worried or anxious, you're probably not paying attention. But we should also not be defeatist. We shouldn't say, we've done nothing, we're failing. We all know there's plenty of bad news when it comes to the climate crisis. But there's also some really good news. We are seeing tremendous progress. Change can come fast. It's happening faster than anyone has expected. We call it cautious optimism. 15 years ago, solar was the most expensive power. Now it is the cheapest form of electricity. I am so excited. This idea of a resilient neighborhood. All of this grass can manage stormwater better. We're going to build a thriving, vibrant, exciting world full of potential. We can do this. We have to do this. Well, hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Now Virtual Climate Town Hall featuring TED Explores A New Climate Vision. I'm Anna Seisling, host of Great Lakes Now, and I'm so grateful to you for tuning in and joining us this evening as we explore with rigor and imagination really innovative solutions to so many different climate challenges that we are facing amid the climate crisis. And as always, please let us know where you're watching from tonight, what you're your name is. And of course, if you have stories about what is or isn't working when it comes to addressing climate change in your community, please drop those questions and comments into the chat as we go. It's going to be a really, really robust conversation tonight, and I'm confident that your voice is going to be part of what makes that happen. So tonight, our moderator for this event is J. Carl Ganter. Carl is a co-founder and director of Circle of Blue, which is the Center for Frontline Reporting, Research, and Analysis on Water Resource Issues and their relationship to food and energy in a changing climate. As a journalist, Carl has been on the front lines of climate and water challenges worldwide, and he's presented at venues like the World Economic Forum, and he is going to be guiding us through a series of really inspiring and important conversations tonight. And with that, I'm really excited to turn things over to Carl for the rest of the town hall. Wow, thanks, Anna. And thanks to all of you for tuning in from all over. Um, as Anna said, too, go ahead and use the chat to let us know where you're watching. And we're also welcoming PBS stations and other organizations streaming as well. And we've put together a resource site to learn more, where you can learn more, and where you can watch the full TED Explorers episode and the link will be in the chat for you. Um, so this historic moment really does mark the intersection of disruption and determination. And we're seeing the effects of a changed climate with more intense droughts and floods and even human migration. And the changing climate is revealing some of the weak links in our systems. But at the same time, it's also awakening us to our potential. New technologies, new science, new ways to work together, and what we can learn from our ancestors. And today we're going to take you on a journey of history and information and ideas and what we can do today together. And we have exceptional experts assembled for you and we'll share a few highlights from the recent TED Explores event about climate change. And we'll learn about what's happening on the front lines because climate and especially its impacts on water, affects our ability to grow food and produce energy. It will shape our cities and our communities and our social or environmental systems. At the UN Climate Summit in Dubai in December, for example, there were breakthroughs and they were balanced by shortcomings. Much of the coverage was about mitigation and that's how we reduce emissions or to slow and reverse climate change. The other big conversation is about adaptation. What will it take to adapt to a changed climate and a warmer world? At the World Economic Forum in Switzerland just a few weeks ago, major companies, leaders, and scientists came together to talk about global political and economic stresses, and they included challenges for a hungrier and thirstier and warmer world. And at Circle of Blue, we're covering this complicated story through the water lens. So from Jakarta, for example, in Jakarta, Indonesia, where rising sea level and overpumping of groundwater are threatening a city of 10 million people. And when I reported from the Mekong River in Vietnam, this may have been the last rice harvest in this finger of the River Delta. On the exact day I took this picture, salt water had been measured 78 kilometers upriver, 
It was a new record for an encroaching sea. And then in India, we found a seriously challenged agriculture system. When farmers' wells go dry, they turn to raw sewage for irrigation. And here they're washing the smell off of the beets using clean water. And they told me they don't eat this produce. They send it to market. They grow their own separately. And in the American Great Lakes, we've documented increasing use of groundwater for irrigated agriculture and that more people are mig migrating northward due to climate change. But let's step back. What are the basics of climate change? And so we have a common language. Let's turn to the TEDx spores for an explanation. The exhaust has transformed the entire atmosphere and ocean. It's like a pollution blanket, and the result we know as climate change. The planet has already warmed more than one degree Celsius and is on a path to heat up even more. That may not seem like a lot, but it's already caused major destruction across the globe. To give us some room to breathe, the world must reduce greenhouse gas pollution by more than 7% each year, every year of this decade. There are a number of ways to do that. Let's start by looking at the greenhouse gases themselves. CO2 makes up nearly 75% of the pollution emitted each year. And then there's methane, or natural gas, which makes up 17%. Finally, there's nitrous oxide, making up 6% of the problem. There are other greenhouse gases, but these three make up the bulk of the climate challenge. Where do they come from? There are several ways to break down the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Here, we're using the public climate watch data. Start with energy. The majority of modern energy comes from burning fossil fuels, which makes the energy sector 76% of the climate challenge, including the fuels used for transportation, industrial processes, and agricultural production. Farming and animal raising also have to change as agriculture accounts for 12% of greenhouse gas pollution. The remaining 12% comes from a grab bag of human activities, like industrial heating, clearing forests, and more. This is the climate challenge we face, going from adding billions of metric tons of greenhouse gases to the air each year to adding zero. Will it be easy? No. Can we do it? Yes, if we choose to. Okay, so that's the situation. Where do we go from here? Well, we've all heard of a tipping point. So that's the situation. Let's go from here. And we're going to welcome two people um, to help us explore our climate future. And we're really fortunate to have David Bielo, TED's lead science curator, and Hank Ovink, who's executive director of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. So it's great to have you here on the same screen together. Um, so I wanted to start with David. And besides so many other roles, um, you're the author of a book called The Unnatural World, The Race to Remake Civilization in Earth's Newest Age. And it's really a true journey in, into the future in many ways. Um, so I want you to give us a sense of what you found on that journey and what's changed perhaps since you wrote the book. How do we make this a, as you say, a good human epoch? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question, and uh, you might recognize uh, my voice from that uh, little video we just watched, which is always a strange experience. Um, so I think when writing that book, I uh, found some of the unusually optimistic people trying to make for a better human impact on the planet. You might have noticed uh, our our impact is is not as great as it could be. In some ways, we are the asteroid. You remember the asteroid from uh, those lessons that killed off the dinosaurs. That's kind of what we're doing uh, right now. But uh, but unlike an asteroid, uh, we don't just have to follow gravity. We can make a change. We could decide to put fewer greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and begin to draw them down. That's where this whole TED countdown initiative comes from. We want, as you saw in that video, to count down the emissions to zero. And as the science curator, I think I can say, we probably want to go even beyond zero because uh, we've already put too much up there. Um, what I can say that has changed for the better 
in the eight years since I uh, wrote that book is we have made more progress than I thought was uh, possible. Uh, as you may have noticed, solar has become cheap. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are declining in places like the United States. Um, but there's still a long, long way to go. And unfortunately, we have baked in, if you will, quite a bit of uh, climate change ahead of us, whether that's sea level rise or the uh, droughts and fires and other impacts we've all seen wherever we live in the world. Great. So how how's how's the conversation changed? We we you know um, David Attenborough always says that saving the planet is a communications challenge. Um, how is the conversations changing um, for David? I think the biggest shift that I personally have seen is that we've finally woken up to the fact that we're not saving the planet. Uh, we are saving ourselves. Uh, this is not about whether this beautiful blue rock we live on that uh, orbits the sun is going to make it through. Whatever the climate is, the planet's going to be going to make it through okay. What might not make it through okay is our cultures, our communities, the civilization that we've built. Uh, and that's what I've seen the biggest change around. And I think to some extent, that is why more and more people are kind of signing up uh, to help combat uh, climate change, that and the fact that it is such a clear and present danger now. It's a, it's a little hard to avoid uh, when all of Canada uh, is on fire, for example. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's becoming much more newsworthy, so to speak, uh, more mainstream. Um, and the stories are, are really visceral um, from the local to the global. Um, I want to, uh, civilizations, I mean, you mentioned this a bit, but are really defined, have been through history, defined by water. Um, civilizations have you know, born on rivers, commerce, um, and when water goes away, so does civilization. Um, so I want to bring in Hank Ovink. And Hank, it's been a really big year for water. Um, the UN Water Conference in March, and at the same time, water crises that are compounding around the world from Panama and Brazil, Pakistan, and the American West are just a few of the regions facing severe water stress now. But as David notes, we're all part of the story. And there's probably no more visceral connection to climate than water, something that we spend a lot of our time on. So give us a sense of the global water situation. What are some of the biggest trends and maybe the biggest misconceptions about water and climate? Thanks so much, uh, Carl, and great to be with you, David, uh, on this uh, uh, town hall talk. Uh, it's amazing. Um, that not only are civilizations defined by water, as you say, uh, uh, more and more, uh, and that's where we are at, is that civilizations define the current water crisis. We have a water cycle. Mm. We think we understand uh, as the water we see in our rivers and lakes. And some people understand there's water in the ground and then we see oceans. Uh, but it's actually, you could say, uh, the water we can manage. Uh, and then there's green water. And green water is what's in our soil and our moisture, but also in our evaporation that's coming from soil and moisture. And this mix between the two is actually now defining climate change. So where we thought that climate change impacts were predominantly water related, which is the case, and focusing on resiliency, adaptation, nature-based solutions would get us over the hill. Now we know that for a two degree world is impossible to achieve without really focusing on water security. Water security defines our biodiversity systems, our carbon sinks and cap capturing measures, but uh, our water cycle also defines uh, the evaporations uh, that are supercharging the atmosphere. And with that supercharging, every degree up, 7% more supercharged atmosphere with more impacts, more freak events across the world. So there's a, this situation of water where our systems, governance, finance, uh, subsidies are tailored, designed based on that culture of civilization and water, that there always is water. Yeah. Uh, a farmer would say, build uh, an infrastructure, we'll manage it and we'll, we'll get to the water. Right now, we extract more fresh water than the planet can actually deliver. And that means fresh water security is in decline, decline while its demands going up. And that means in the context of an increased climate change, defaulting biodiversity by exactly uh, uh, freshwater in decline, as well as, you know, uh, pollution across the planet, 
that puts not only our environment at risk. So while the planet as a thing might survive, uh, we actually put, of course, uh, the extinction of life on that planet at risk, not only humans. Uh, and it, at the same time, while we undermine exactly that natural resource, water, and with that, uh, the whole system of biodiversity, we undermine food security, energy security, the security of our investments, and therefore the security of societies. And of course, we always thought with climate change that the most vulnerable would feel it most and hardest. But right now we see that the impact as well as the origins from climate change are happening across the world. So north or south, east or west, we're all affected. And with this water flows across the world, water is way beyond local. We thought we could manage it on a community or an industry level. Well, some said a riverine or aquifer, so let's work together across the border. No, water is local, regional mm -hmm. and global. And I think changing that in the context on how we deal with climate and biodiversity loss is really helpful because while it sounds challenging, water is also your best solution space. Invest in water and we create massive opportunity for our societies, for our economies, and yes, for our environment. Well, thanks, Hank. Uh, just a quick reminder to our audience, um, put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, and uh, David, you were nodding there, um, you know, water being a visceral way to talk about climate and um, all the, the systems pieces that Hank was just talking about, maybe for both of you, why, why has water taken so long uh, to come on to the climate agenda, so to speak? Please, Hank, you first. All of you. <laughs> well, there are many reasons. Uh, one, we took it for granted. Uh, like I said, there was, a, and it, that, it was the case, there always was water. So we designed our governance systems that go back thousands of years in uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan, Iran. Uh, the infrastructure that came with it on the fact that there is water that we could actually transport to the user. So we bypassed actually the fact that water is a scarce resource. It's also a human right, so it's not a commodity, so there's no price. Well, there is exactly a value to water that is beyond finance, that it's cultural and economic, but we tend to overlook that. So one, abundance, second, no value. Uh, and, and, and third, it ha also has a little bit to do with the water sector itself, a very siloed, male dominant engineer community that always was in the corner of the room that you could call for a solution. <laughs> right now, you know, we we literally broke down or are, are on the on the on the river, you could say, to break down this water cycle. Now, right now, it's time to stop siloing our approaches. It's about to connecting the dots and let the energy sector and the food sector and the finance sector and the urbanists and the planners and the, the ecologists come in and say, hey, water is our baseline for survival, but also our best investment opportunity and our pathway for sustainable development across all the goals, as well as climate action in mitigation and adaptation. So this is not a water problem. This is a problem of everyone that we can solve if only we bring those forces together. But that didn't happen. That is why water, because it was complex and you know it was always there. We kept it outside of the room of the negotiations, the policy makers, as well as the solution. I think I would add that, first of all, I agree with everything that you just said. Uh, and too often we treat these uh, challenges, environmental or social in, in silos. Uh, so, oh, that's a water issue. Oh, that's a climate yeah. issue oh, that's a biodiversity issue, which is, you know, all life on Earth, uh, you know, kind of a, a bland word for all life on Earth, um, when in fact they're all interrelated. Um, and we have a, a bad habit of uh, putting no financial value on the things that are most valuable, like water. You know, water is life. Without it, uh, we do not live, uh, and yet uh, we don't treat it with that kind of uh, financial value. So now people have woken up to the fact that we need to take a more systemic approach 
Uh, honestly, that's uh, kind of why I wrote my book was to try to uh, wake people up to this fact that these problems are all interconnected and interrelated. And maybe you could solve uh, water issues uh, on their own. But if you did that, you would probably engender a whole host of other issues in the biodiversity realm or the climate realm or or some of these other uh, challenges. They're all interconnected. And unless we solve them all kind of together, uh, we won't solve any of them individually. No, absolutely. It's just definitely uh, you know, systemic approaches here and and also such still such disconnects uh, because last week we saw farmers in Europe uh, protesting new climate regulations while at the same time they're facing drought and other climate impacts. Um, so how do we get on the same page? There's still, there's still such dissonance. Well, I guess I'll jump in there because uh, that's kind of my job is to get people on the same page. Uh, what I will, I'm going to say two things, the first of which may be shocking. We will never be on the same page and that's okay. Um, in some ways, it's a good thing. We need all the different solutions and different points of views and different uh, approaches to solving these problems as we can get. And we're not all going to agree on probably almost anything ever. Uh, you know, there are so many jokes in the world about get three people in a room and you'll get five different answers. It doesn't matter whether the, the type of person in that joke is an engineer or a priest or, or whomever. Um, that's just part of uh, human nature, I might submit. Um, the second part I would say is it doesn't matter whether we're on the same page if we're all pulling in the same direction. So I'll give the example of solar panels on your rooftop. You might do that because you care about climate change and you want there to be less coal burning in the world. You also might do that because you don't like utility companies and you want to have energy independence. Does it matter why you put the solar panels up there? It really doesn't, as long as they're up there generating that clean electricity. Can I add? Yes, yeah, go ahead, Hank, because please. I please. agree. Uh, uh, the diversity is uh, the beauty uh, at, from an economic perspective. There's this famous Dutch economist, Tim Berg, that said, we can only deal with the complexity of our challenges if we're able to deal with the complexity in the way we approach them. That complexity is not only about the economic, social, and environmental issues. Those are the cultural and political aspects too, individual, institutional, informal, across the world. I learned working on water in all those places where water crises are at the forefront by organizing a conversation on water you connect the dots because water is linked to health, the environment, energy, climate, biodiversity, to the survival of a small scale community, a family, or a bigger in industry up or downstream a river. And it's actually these water conversations that are not uh, eradicating uh, the differences. No, perhaps they even amplify them, but through the diversity of voices and interest you create opportunities that are systemic uh, uh, and those systemic comprehensive holistic solutions bring resiliency and sustainability and equity in a system that you never seen before so you bypass a single focused siloed uh, approach by uh, making sure that, you, that we acknowledge the differences but create safety in the process for those differences to continue to have a voice and a say small next to large, uh, north next to south, uh, bigger interest next to more vulnerable. And exactly that dialogue, that conversation, that partnership can really help drive the solutions that we so much need. And then if we do that, we see that there's scalability and replicability in these solutions. So we're literally able to also speed up uh, where we want to go. And so then the ambition comes eh, next to that it perhaps doesn't matter why that solar panel is on the roof, scaling that does matter because it, it has to happen with an ambition. Wow, I will admit, it makes the politics messy. Right. 
Yeah, and, and we have a question too here, just or, or a point, um, and really I think it's aimed to David too, is um, the critical issues on women and girls' roles um, in particularly water, but on the forefront of climate change. Um, oftentimes um, uh, it's, it's women on the front lines. I've walked with uh, young women in the Tar Desert in Rajasthan um, for hours in 112 degree heat just to go get water. Yeah, I, there's no question that uh, we live in an unequal world. And one of the biggest inequalities on a global level is that between uh, men and uh, women. Uh, what I can say from, from my work is that oftentimes um, empowered women are at the forefront of uh, some of these diverse solutions to the various environmental challenges we're facing, whether that's uh, smallholder farmers uh, in various African countries, um, uh, kind of changing agricultural practices, uh, or uh, just uh, a little bit of female leadership uh, here in the United States uh, to drive for more systemic solutions. No, that's great. Um, and that's really important. And also, again, reminder, um, put your questions in the chat. Uh, where are you watching from? How is climate change affecting your community? And is or how is your community taking action? Um, let us know how you feel and what you'd like to share. So put those in the chat and we'll get to those. Um, so another quick question too. So the definition of innovation, we tend to, we th like to throw a lot of technology uh, at big challenges. Um, for both of you, um, innovation is usually defined by say a Silicon Valley startup or a, a shiny new object of, of technology, but innovation has a much broader definition, I think. You're, you're picking on the T in TED, which is uh, technology. <laughs> and you'll notice that there, that uh, I am the sole specialist curator who's, uh, whose discipline, science, is not in the acronym. So, you know, <laughs> I don't have a chip on my shoulder or anything. TEDs, like. TEDs. We can put an S on the end. <laughs> no, I want to be at the front instead. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, what I would say to that is you're absolutely right. Uh, innovation is not just about uh, the latest gadget. In fact, it's rarely about the latest gadget. Say impactful innovation often uh, is coming in social spaces, uh, different ways to mobilize people uh, around a problem. That's a kind of uh, innovation that we don't look at often uh, enough. And, I'm, and I especially see that, at least from my perspective, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, Hank, uh, in the in the water space, I feel like people get really creative about about water, uh, especially the Dutch, but uh, but many other peoples as well. Yeah, I think innovation in, indeed matches so many uh, aspects of our uh, our societies. And uh, the way I look at innovation is that it's typically uh, cultural. It's about people's uh, partnerships that really bring a diversity of learning being them indigenous young uh, women led uh, together with the innovations that uh, we might put under the banner of technology but are are way beyond what we saw in in the past as technology i worked around the world on water in many places and we need you know uh, everybody knows you we can't solve tomorrow's problems with the stupidity of the past that we have to reinvent ourselves constantly and it's exactly by bringing the people together. And again, I'm, I'm going to uh, say it again, in a in a safe space, in in an approach, a process where there is an opportunity to come together, where the diversity of voices we talked about, about is acknowledged, but also um, celebrated. And it's exactly in those differences, you create the opportunity that people are driving the innovations. Um, I set up a program, it was uh, called water as leverage, really using water as a lever for change, creating these conversations, developing these conversations in cities in Asia and in Latin America and Africa. We're bringing the community together with governments, private sectors, investors, designers, innovators from across the world. And in these conversations, every individual voice contributed. So the innovation there, in the end, Part of it was nature-based or cultural-based or indigenous-based and technology-based. And there were cool apps and you could watch it on smartphones, but there was also about plants and infrastructure and green and blue and gray and the whole mix. That was innovative and it worked. Less cost, less emission, more ownership. You really created a cultural change. So innovation is measured by the impact it can have, but also you could say the sustainability 
is it scalable, replicable? Are we able to create the alternative for the stupidity of pipelines we currently have in the hands of the investor? Because that sets us off track towards the goal where we want to go. Well, innovation spurred by people, science, eh? solidarity, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and that, that clear systems understanding can really help us present an alternative uh, that will drive uh, climate action as well as sustainability action in a very inclusive way. So innovation uh, mm -hmm. beyond this, the technology for sure. Yeah, and, I always Hank, say that you yeah. need it, you, you know, there's billions or trillions out there to spend on infrastructure. You need <laughs> a million to spend on people. If we spend millions on the process, we're able to attract the trillions to invest in these innovative cool projects. But if you focus on the latter, uh, then you'll never get the people together and also not that diversity of voices. So invest in people, that makes investments in infrastructure work. The other way around, it too often fails. People are the key. Yep. Yeah. Oh, though brilliant. And and uh, Hank, we were part of that uh, session, I think, a year ago or so in Washington, talking yes. about what's holding us back on innovation. Right. And it became quite spirited. And around that same track, invest in the people and the institutions that will encourage innovation. Um, so we also just a, a quick comment too from one of our viewers in Wisconsin. Um, who said they've been it's warmer. They've been picking ticks off uh, off himself and his dog through December, and starting exactly. again in February. So. Um, a warmer season here. We're light on snow here in Michigan. Um, so it has its consequences. So let's uh, thank David and Hankins, but stay here. Um, we're going to bring in two more voices into the conversation um, who are looking at these issues through complementary lenses. Um, we have uh, Dr. Chelsea Shelley, um, who's Director of Research at the Center for Innovation and Sustainability and Resilience at Michigan Technological University. And we have Kurt Wolf, um, who is the University of Michigan's Director of Urban Collaboratory and co-lead on the Michigan Center for Freshwater Innovation. We have innovation in both your titles. Um, so welcome. And let's, uh, let's start with Dr. Shelley and you know maybe picking up on some of the conversation earlier, but you're at the intersection of sociology and sustainability. And we just heard from Hank. Uh, about the the human tipping points, uh, positive tipping points for water, climate, and planetary boundaries. So I guess my question is, how are we doing as humans sociologically? You know, are we seeing social transformation tipping points around these existential challenges? Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, I guess I want to start by just acknowledging the reality that we as humans are nowhere near living within the planetary limits that are really foundational to embedding human life within the planetary community of life that we're really a part of. Um, so we do have a lot of work to do, but we have made incredible strides. And some of those strides are in recognizing that we have much of the technology or the material systems that, that can help us start to move in the right direction, but also recognizing the relationship between those material systems or the technologies that we use to get access to water or get access to energy um, and the ways that we organize socially. Uh, I also want to kind of acknowledge that I work at a university, so I'm working with younger people. The research that I do is all in engagement with communities and individuals who either want to change the technologies that they're using or already are changing the technologies that they're using. So I come from a place of great optimism, um, despite the realities that we face, um, because I see so much excitement about changing. And I think the, the thing that really sticks out to me in the conversation that was just happening was recognizing that um, people's behavior can be motivated by a lot of different value systems and that actually what matters the most is their behavior. And as a social scientist, a scientist of social groups, you know, we for a long time thought that to get people to change their behavior, we needed to educate them or get them to change their values. And actually what changes behavior the most is new experiences. And so when you put people into situations where they can use new systems, use new technologies, live in more decommodified or localized or simple ways than they thought possible, um, that that's actually what changes the thought pattern about whether or not we can do those things. And so as as they were talking about just really recognizing that there's, there's a people element here and that a, a part of what gives me excitement is seeing 
thinking that as people do get exposed to new technologies, new ways of organizing infrastructures, um, people are most supportive of the technologies that they see. Um, and I work particularly in energy systems, and that's true whether you're talking about wind turbines or solar panels or oil pipelines, people are generally speaking most supportive of the technologies that they see, the energy infrastructures that they see. So as we see new technologies coming onto the landscape, that can help to change people's perceptions of those very technologies. And as we see opportunities to engage in new ways ways of living and being and knowing and experiencing new systems that has the potential to change the way that people think about those systems that we don't actually need to put so much effort into changing values or thought patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives me a lot of optimism. Ah, so I was going to ask you, just tell, tell us more about social groups and, and, and then also how you're, how you're, so how some of those values either are, are, are changing or um, kind of shifting the, um, the lens a bit. Yeah, so I think, you know, again, research really suggests that the things that matter most for changing people's ideas about what's possible or their own habits and at an individual level or collective kind of community level is changing the systems around people. So one example that seems really simple, you know, they did um, a very robust study of how to get people to turn off their lights in a hotel room. <clears throat> thing that made the most difference was using the key card as the way you turn on and off the lights. And so we can kind of scale that example up to thinking about how do we change our transport systems? Well, we build infrastructures where you can charge an electric vehicle, you can bike, you change the system around people, those material, physical, infrastructural systems, and that changes how people engage with those those systems, mm -hmm. those things that are really having an impact. And so again, for me, the excitement is that as we have the investment in changing infrastructure, as we have the policy to change the, the ways that we're using energy mm -hmm. or water, um, we can change, we'll think about what's normal when it comes to the patterns and the habits um, that we engage in, <laughs> in collective ways. If there's one big habit or one big uh, value or power you could change, what, what would it be? You mentioned key cards, but what would be the yeah. uh, kind of the bigger picture? Yeah, so for me, I think as a sociologist, I would say that um, the, the, the most potential is in thinking sociologically and recognizing that the, the ways that we've come to pattern our thoughts are things that we've internalized and socialized through the societies that we live in. And, and we have the potential to change those patterns of thought. And for me, our, our human superpower would be to, to recognize that we are just one species among many species on the planet and actually much more similar to the other species than we tend to, to think about. And if we can can repattern our way of thinking to see that we are just one species among many in this global community of life. I think, and again, I'm a sociologist, I think about humans and social systems, but I think we can look to the, the other animal species that we share the planet with and see how incredibly effective they are at collective action. Whether we're talking about ants or termites or pack predators, we know that animals are really effective when they work together in groups. And I think if we can see ourselves as just one species on the planet, maybe that can help inspire us to see ourselves as really effective when we're working together. Oh, great. Thank you. And and a lot of comments here just about how um, even this year uh, people are feeling affected, feeling affected by a warmer winter. I mentioned um, I mentioned ticks. Somebody else has mentioned uh, bird migration. Um, somebody's mentioned ice cover on, uh, on Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes. Um, so a reminder, of course, so please put your questions in the chat and uh, we'll put them to our, our esteemed group here. Um, so a question for Kurt, Kurt Wolf. Um, you're looking at the world through uh, kind of a similar lens and that's bringing together diverse groups to collaborate or collaboratory on complex issues and particularly in the Great Lakes. And collaboration is easy to say, but it's really hard to do. I mean, it's, it's a sustainable development goal number 17 basically. And, you know, I heard a quote from one scientist who recently said that we're slow walking our way into really dangerous territory. And we've kind of heard that. And one way to, one way to not slow walk that way is to collaborate. And considering the complexity of these challenges in the timeline, how do we run faster and how do we run faster together uh, in the collaboration piece? What are the, what are the pieces that you're seeing that are giving you um, inspiration or, you know, concern, what are some of the impediments? 
Well, I think we're um, doing a series of projects in Southeast Michigan on, on collaboration on climate change and water issues. <clears throat> and I think, uh, I think often if you get everyone in the same room, you talk about values, you, you, you tend to find a common, common theme, a common thread. So I think, um, I think one of the, the reason our institute got started, the Michigan Center for Freshwater Innovation, is that we, um, I found ourselves working with other universities on common problems in Southeast Michigan. Um, and we got the idea, well, what if we collaborated on groundwater challenges for the region? So we started off with this group of three um, universities, Michigan State, Wayne State, and University of Michigan, um, and decided to pull together a collaboration of, of stakeholders across the region that could really get together and, and affect change. Um, and so we've been collaborating on, on a lot of stormwater issues for the region. But, um, you know, often when you pull everyone together, they're very like-minded. And I, it's, it's nice, it's great to kind of develop common themes that you can rally around, and, you know, providing fresh water, uh, preventing flooding uh, in the city and other regions is, are issues that people can get behind and collaborate on. So if we're talking about, uh, so collaboration, we heard about some of the impediments too. Um, what are some of the um, <laughs> to-dos and maybe the, the not to-dos um, when we're talking about collaboration? Some of the assumptions um, that it's easy, um, we can solve this tomorrow. What's, what have you learned? What, what can we take away from that? What's interesting is I find it's, it's often not about the technology, it's about these barriers to the adoption of technology. Um, so it could be political barriers, it could be risk transfer barriers, it could be um, uh, regulatory barriers, for instance. Um, uh, one of our great partners is the Michigan Department of Environment and Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE, um, and they've been a tremendous partner. We've been bringing some of these ideas to EGLE and talking about ways we can work with the region to kind of uh, bring out of the box solutions to the table to kind of address climate adaptation measures. You know, one reason our group is called Michigan Center for Freshwater Innovation is that this region has unique problems uh, with climate change. We, we're in a region that has a lot of water. We have 20% of the world's freshwater supply. We also have stressed aquifers. Um, uh, so we have lots of water and we're seeing increased rain events. Uh, this, the whole region was designed to handle two inches of rain in approximately 24 hours and we're seeing six and eight inch rains. We had catastrophic rains in 2021. So these catastrophic events have really reframed how the region's thinking and, and how these different uh, into, uh, political um, uh, jurisdictions can cooperate to kind of operate as a region more efficiently and manage the resources we have to get uh, a bigger bang out of the infrastructure we have and kind of uh, uh, managing these problems together. Great, and and just any uh, on the what you've learned um, on the collaboration side. Are there any any steps to it to um, uh, to avoid, so to speak, or, or some of those assumptions? Um, I think I think it's it's good to align. Um, desired outcomes. So once again, um, uh, working in this region and uh, operating on limited budgets, we've, we've all come to the conclusion we can't build our way out of climate change, that uh, we can't just keep building bigger and bigger pipes, that we have to, to think of ways of bringing innovative solutions and technologies and approaches to climate change to the region. And trying to eliminate the barriers that are allowing us to, to move forward with, with instituting these changes are, are critical. You know, for instance, um, in this region, we're trying to consider uh, ways of dewatering the system once it rains or ways of managing flows as they come into the system. This is a large uh, metropolitan area. Once again, serves 40% of the population of Michigan and storms don't dump their rains on, on, on equally around the region. So how can we uh, leveraging technology better manage flows through the system? Um, the water flows downhill and uh, uh, most of the central part of Detroit is the lower end of the watershed. So how can we maybe work with upper reaches of the watershed to, to better manage flows that come down into the city to reduce uh, flooding in the city and basement backups, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, now we have a chance uh, for everybody to uh, to chat. Um, I'm sure uh, some of the provocations here, um, you know, Hank, David, um, any other, any, any thoughts or questions you want to put to each other here? Now is your I mean, chance. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I think uh, one of the interesting reframings I've heard uh, recently, and of course I heard it in the TED talk, was uh, what would we do differently if we thought we would succeed? Um, I think we often are sort of taking for granted that it's not going well and that we're 
we are going to build our way out of the problem uh, or uh, values won't matter or, or what have you. What would what would each of you do differently if you thought we would succeed? Oh, question for everybody. I think that's a good question. Right, go I guess the, yeah, the thing that comes to mind for me is just thinking that um, the way that we've organized the access to the things that we need to live comfortable, quality lives in the past doesn't have to be the way that we do it moving forward. So thinking about um, who owns energy systems, how we manage water infrastructure, all of those kinds of questions of the social or political organization, I think to me, it's not only recognizing we have the technology to make significant change, but that with the changes in the technology, we can also change how we organize ownership and control and decision making and um, the economic benefits of those technologies. And so that for me is what I would think of as what we can change is not just how we meet our needs and comforts in terms of the material stuff, but also how we organize that socially and again, who benefits from that organization. I also think it's important to incentivize desired behaviors. So um, uh, I live in Ann Arbor and, and, and it's just one area and it's a very uh, affluent community with a lot of like-minded folks. And yet it's really hard to get past uh, the starting point when you talk about like decarbonizing the city. So mm -hmm. uh, there are, there, and there's often barriers even in communities of very like-minded folks to adopting new technology, new approaches. I mean, one small example is um, uh, tr trying to decarbonize buildings here in town. And, and uh, we brought a bunch of developers in to talk to them about, about what they're experiencing dealing with the city. And we, we learned some really interesting things. It wasn't that the developers didn't have the technology or the, the ability to decarbonize buildings. It was they were they were seeing barriers. Uh, mm -hmm. The city uh, uh, it wrote a very you know aggressive um, uh, ordinance to, to force developers to um, uh, plan for 2050 when everything is electric. And the, the grid can't handle that now. So they go to the electric company wanting permits for these projects. And the electric company says, we don't have the power to give you. So I think it's thinking through these complex sy system of barriers. It's not always about the technology. It's about mm -hmm. what's stopping the technology from moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and Hank, you, you worked on uh, some rebuilding projects uh, that were quite, quite uh, uh, remarkable. How did you how did you overcome some of those? So I think um, I uh, but I was born like the, the, the massive optimist. So I actually <laughs> always do think it's possible so it is it's my mother was like a like the true activist of the family first female school director post world war ii in the netherlands my father was a an engineer but an architect engineer so a designer he was a little bit crazy in that sense uh, so they both always taught me to think about that it is possible uh when i worked uh, post these disasters or you know, I chaired the water conversations between the Israelis and the Palestinians for seven and a half years. I mean, the the, the in, worked in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also uh, post Hurricane Sandy in New York. And in New York, my team also got hate mail saying, you know, we don't want to see you. Eh? Uh, but going back and back and back, it's possible to organize those conversations, bring people together, acknowledge that they disagree but also figure out how you create a common sense of understanding that the urgency, while massive, also creates opportunities that are very diverse. Eh? There is no one fix to these massive problems. The beauty of that is uh, everybody has to change and learning that you all have to leave something behind to gain something, not only you, but also your neighbor and the ones you love and the ones you love a little bit less creates a sense not only of urgency, but also of ownership that you can look beyond what you lose yourself. Eh? You're in it together. But that feel of creating that uh, is often lacking, but we can do it. Uh, and if we can, I mean, if we can do it in India and Bangladesh and in New York, we can do it anywhere. Uh, eh? It is possible. So I think uh, uh, it, it demands a ton of energy, massive amounts of, you know, stupidity. Also, you walk into a wall 10 times a day. That's fine. <laughs> we'll continue. That stubbornness is important. But I think that that optimism that you can bring up, oh, bring in the youth as well. Eh? 
young voices, empower them, you know, uh, ensuring that inclusivity is not a noun, but a verb that you practice it every day over and over and hold yourself accountable to those rules. I think it's amazing. And then you can create opportunities together, not because I think they're amazing, but because they think they're amazing, and then hmm. they're, they, they can be implemented. And of course, the other thing is, uh, um, a good friend of mine, a New York Times journalist, Michael Kimmelman, wrote a, a piece on one of the projects we did on uh, President Obama's Hurricane Sandy task force post Hurricane Sandy here in New York. And uh, it, it's so complex that nobody was really unhappy. Uh, nobody perhaps was also really happy. But after a while, people say, oh, look, hey, it is a new park. It gives mm -hmm. us protection. We have better mm -hmm. access, you know. So it's a learning process. Change, you know, it, it's, it's tough. Eh? Um, and the stubbornness, mm -hmm. there's this saying, you know, if you really want to continue, it, it's slow, eh? the iteration of steps. So uh, um, consistency, continuity, and commitment are perhaps boring words, but they're mm -hmm. critically important to be able to drive that change that we all you know, envision. And some see beyond the horizon and yeah. others don't. It doesn't matter. We're all heading for that horizon. We, we can be much more happier and resilient and sustainable and with a far more inclusive society if we do this different. Yeah. So I, yeah, Great. But I'm the optimist. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not stupid. I also see where it fails, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. I do see everywhere in every context, in every, on every continent, even in the most fragile context, that it is possible to drive that change together. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, and I've got, I uh, want to come back to our group here before we transition. Um, a, a quick question that's, that's come up a couple times in the chat, and, and Hank, this is a little off the climate side, but it's more on the water side. How do we address micro and nanoplastic pollution? Um, something that's that's big in the news. Um, not quite a climate question, but it's also a systems and a, and a perception and action question. Yeah, what you put in, it's hard to get out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. The, really the problem. And uh, and of course, right now we have to focus on both. Uh, uh, luckily, there is way more awareness on pollution in our rivers, oceans, uh, and, and lakes. Uh, luckily, it creates a, a really a action oriented mm -hmm. ownership also with the private sector and with governments and communities. What I'm really worried about is the, uh, the groundwater that is now so polluted uh, that uh, the, the freshwater resources that we so depend on uh, are, is, well, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's very hard to depend on, but tackle, mm -hmm. we have to tackle this across the world. Yeah. Pollution is, and then in the combination with climate change and water decrease, water scarcity, we yeah. have a, you know, crippling effect, not only on our economies and our environment, but on our health. Eh? It is about right. us. It's about right. our children that are drinking water that's prevents them from grow, growing. So this is what we do to ourselves. So it's it's way, in that sense, smaller in scale of, of mm -hmm. influence than you can expect, than you yeah. would expect. So before we transition, very quick answers. Um, I'd like for our audience, um, for each of you, and, and uh, um, what's the one superpower that those watching? Uh, we've talked a lot about, about big pictures here um, and about policies and whatnot. What's the superpower that those watching might not realize they have, but that they can activate to help drive the change, the scale and speed we're hearing about. Um, maybe start with Chelsea. Yeah. So in addition to trying to rethink our relationship to um, what we see as nature as somehow separate from us, I guess the other thing I would say is just recognizing the power of new experiences and getting outside of our mm -hmm. own bubbles. You know, we've done a lot of on conservation and mm -hmm. um, thinking about environmentally responsible behavior in the home. And it's really hard for people to think outside of their socioeconomic position and whatever they've come to see as normal around them and in their neighborhood. But I really think that um, recognizing that if you experience something totally new for just a little bit of time, it will change your mind about what you think is possible. So mm -hmm. living in a, a much more simple way or making a commitment that right now seems really big can become a habit very quickly. And for me, that would be our power as we're so elastic as humans, so much more elastic than I think we recognize. 
Great. And and Kurt, what's the what's the superpower? I don't know if it's a superpower, but I'm I'm a big fan of really understanding your carbon footprint. I have so many mm -hmm. friends with solar panels on their roof, yet they fly to California three or four times a month. Um, so I think it's really important to 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 understand your carbon footprint, try to try to improve it. You know, and also in a region like we have that has great water resources, water consumption correlates directly with energy, and energy creates carbon. So I think even in a in a region like us that has a lot of water and has a lot of capacity to create fresh water. Uh, I think I think it's really important to to realize that water correlates to to, to energy. So I think just understanding uh, on a holistic manner, whether you're buying a car or whether you're traveling or whatever, to understand um, what your impact is on the environment. Um, Hank, a really quick one, and I'll come to David. I think dare to ask a question, but be very sincere in daring that question, but also dare to listen to the answer. I think that's the the superpower that makes the connection, builds a relationship. Wow, dare to listen. And then David, what's a superpower? I mean, we have so many superpowers, but uh, to build on Hank's answer, actually, I think it the the first and foremost one is just to talk about it. We don't we don't talk about climate change enough. Um, uh, whether we agree or not, I'm not sure we even know. Um, it's kind of one of those third rails. Uh, at least here in the United States. So uh, humans are pretty good at talking. Uh, so use that superpower and, uh, and and see what happens. And and then, like Hank said, also dare to listen to what someone else is saying about climate change. Great. Well, well thank you. And thanks for listening and talking um, and sharing. Um, so David, Hank, and Chelsea, uh, thanks so much for dynamic conversation. And we're going to also invite our viewers to put their questions in the chat. Um, what's your superpower? Um, what's your greatest strength that you can bring to the conversation and to the change? We talked about innovation. We've talked about speed, agility. We've talked about uh, equity and vulnerable populations. Um, so let's welcome our next round of guests uh, as we continue this town hall, which is brought to you by Detroit Public Television's Great Lakes Now, TED, PBS, and Circle of Blue. And let us know, like I said, in the chat, where are you watching from? How is climate change affecting your community and even your day-to-day -day life? And how is your community addressing climate change or not? Um, so let's bring it down to the local and regional levels. Um, we're here in the Great Lakes um, as a bellwether, as we've heard earlier from some of the um, people chiming in uh, online um, for the local to global impacts. And we'll, in a few moments, we'll be joined by Justin Bibb, who's mayor of Cleveland um, and the chair of Climate Mayors. But first, we're going to have Ann Bauman, uh, who's Associate Director of Freshwater Future. And Ann helps communities address the impacts of climate change. And we have Valerie Gagnon, uh, Director of the University Indigenous Community Partnerships at the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Technological University. Um, hi, nice, nice to see you. Good evening, um, hello. Thanks, um, let's start with Ann. And because a lot of your works, you've heard our conversation here, and a lot of your works focused on helping communities manage capacity and finances and bringing together people around water. Um, what's it look like a day to day and what kinds of projects are people working on as it relates to water and climate in the Great Lakes? Are we taking it for granted? Are we acting uh, at scale? That's, that's a great question. And, you know, from a day to day point of view, uh, what it looks like for us at Freshwater Future, you know, to really be a catalyst for community action to protect water resources. You know, we start by really providing small grants to support community groups um, to protect their drinking water, to protect their surface waters. Um, they do projects like testing for lead in drinking water, providing filters to ensure that there um, isn't um, the water safe to drink. It might be monitoring um, proposed open pit and sulfide mines uh, that, you know, there's a big boom for mining in our um, northern Great Lakes region for the metals that we need for our EV cars. So it's really important to have those EV cars, but we need to also make sure that those mines go in in a way that they don't harm the water resources that we so rely on. It might be actually monitoring impacts from industrial ag waste that's really contributing to harmful algal blooms. 
uh, you know, that's one of the things that it looks like from a day to day. It's also providing very personalized coaching and assistance to these organizations so that they can uh, really protect the resources in their community. They know the water best, they know the resources best, and we're there to help them be there for for a long time to protect the resources. It might be helping them to get a 501c3. Mm -hmm. It might be helping them get a database, or it might be helping them with just basic planning, strategic planning. And I think perhaps most importantly, and I think uh, Hank already uh, talked about it, but it really is listening. This, that's what we do the most of. We listen to the communities around the Great Lakes. We want to learn about what their water issues are, what's needed to address the problem, and then how can we bring the people and the players together so that we can find the policies that need to be changed or modified to support the solutions that the community residents are really advocating for. Now, great, uh, great point, and I'm really curious uh, um, to pick up on that. Just connecting the dots between the communities and the policymakers. Um, you know, what's working, and and where do we need work? Yeah, I think you know, there's there's so many ways where it's working. Um, so I think that's a really good thing. Um, you know, one of the ways that we've been doing that is really by providing communities tools. And so, you know, for example, one of the things we've been doing um, in Detroit in particular is working with some partner community organizations um, in several neighborhoods um, to provide them with tools so that they can collect more data on flooding. So they're using a very simple app um, to collect and document where flooding is occurring. And then they can, we can help them produce maps um, to analyze that data to look at where it's happening very frequently um, and then they can look the community members look at that information to decide okay this is what's happening what's the real cause and what do we want to happen and then they can take that data to the city to the um, other officials in the community and say, these are the solutions we want so it's really building their power so that they can then advocate for the solutions that they want to have. Um, so we're really just mm -hmm. providing that basis and that um, support. And that is starting to work. So it's really kind of exciting. I think where nice. we need more is, you know, I, we've been talking a little bit about or listening to everyone talk about the, the systems approach and how systemic the problems are with climate change. And it's the same way with flooding in Detroit. You know, we need to look at the hyper localized problems, but then we also need to look at a bigger scale. What else needs mm -hmm. to be done at the neighborhood level? What needs to be done at the multi neighborhood level? What needs to be done at the city? What needs to be done upstream communities to make sure they're not dumping excessive um, storm water onto downstream communities? Great, thank you. And and I want to re uh, remind our audience too to uh, uh, again, what's your superpower? Uh, we asked our previous panelists um, what they recommended or what theirs were. Uh, what's your superpower? What do you want to activate? How do you want to listen? Or how do you want to bring your voice forward? Um, and Valerie, I'm I'm really interested about uh, particularly about your work in um, uh, bringing indigenous voices forward and looking at um, at systems from perhaps a a, a different perspective. Uh, tell us more about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm definitely not a climate scientist. Uh, I work with. Uh, Anishinaabe nations here in the Great Lakes, uh, primarily the Ojibwe people uh, in Lake Superior's Keweenaw Bay. And we've also partnered at Michigan Tech with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And it's really about uh, listening, again, is, is incredibly important, and aligning our research and education um, to ensure that their priorities are are being heard and also um, become research objectives that we can work together on. They also help us see um, different, uh, different solutions, different ways of framing questions. Um, and sometimes those are also much more optimistic than even um, us as researchers. Well, wow, tell me about that. Uh, tell me more about framing questions, um, because you know, changing climate means 
a change in important seasonal markers like animal migration and even mm -hmm. uh, springtime sap flows for maple syrup um, and indigenous yeah. cultures. Yes, there has been um, a lot of conversation about uh, the term that I learned was phonology and about how these different relationships within the ecosystems, uh, the timing is is getting um, getting off. And so when we think about um, trees and and plants and different animals, fish, uh, birds and insects, um, for example, uh, bats are waking up with no food. Uh, fish are within waters that are warming and they require the cold waters. And, and so how can we think about all of these relationships uh, across the landscape when many times in science, we like to focus on uh, one species or, or one um, lake or specific functions. And what it has really required is for researchers across disciplines and also uh, the expertise of community members who have these relationships, who retain and have been um, shared the knowledge that comes from many generations. And so their, their questions are relevant and important to their community members, but they can also be really important ways of looking at uh, problems and solutions for communities more abroad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd love to just, uh, maybe you have an example, um, something we can learn from the past uh, to shape our future, uh, if you've got something. I, first of all, I think there are so many lessons of the past, right? And, and we've talked about many of those um, here, and I think it was Hank that said something about um, being stupid like that plainly, but um, just because we have those lessons doesn't necessarily mean that we're learning the the right lessons. Um, how to uh, recreate or or remake or have different sets of priorities, like um, how Chelsea was talking earlier about we can really live w more simpler. Uh, we can uh, grow some of our own food. We can rely on our local markets. We can even trade with other people. It, everything doesn't need to be tied to this other kind of economic system that um, we've grown accustomed to as if everything has a dollar value. Um, and through these trades, whether that's through um, local maple syrup, as you noted, or just helping each other out in different kinds of harvest. Um, these are all critical ways of thinking differently and, and mm -hmm. to inform different ways of doing things together. Oh, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, and before we bring in uh, um, Justin here in a second, um, and a quick question too for you. Um, what, and this is a transition um, to uh, bring in the mayor, is what should be happening in the Great Lakes Basin at scale? What's your biggest vision? You're working a lot with communities and policy. What's your biggest vision in, in the Great Lakes Basin? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> but, you <laughs> know, somebody question. already said we've got 20% of the world's freshwater surface resources here, right? It's, the, it's a huge um, amount of the world's fresh water. And so we need to protect it. It supplies drinking water for over 40 million people. So, you know, my vision is for us to um, have that um, community driven kind of solutions that um, are diverse throughout the entire region, right? They mm -hmm. are, they are um, created at the local level and they reflect and respect what needs to happen based on the local culture, but that they have to tackle at all different levels. Um, these problems are big. There's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. It's going to mm -hmm. take that creativity, that innovation, that diversity. Um, and it really does get to take the people power, right? Which means really taking that time to listen to community, engage the community, 
and hear what they think needs to happen. Wow, a perfect transition. Stay here. Uh, don't go anywhere. Um, but I want to turn to Mayor Justin Bibb um, from Cleveland. And um, he's popping up on the screen here. There we go. Hi, welcome. Good evening. Um, I How hope you doing? You've had, you've had a chance to tune in. And, and yeah. this is the perfect opportunity, I think, um, to uh, reflect. You've, you know, you're coming at this from a city perspective, but also from a national perspective. Um, mayors are, are, are really taking a leadership role in climate um, and a lot of other issues in the nation. Um, quick reflections first on the conversation, then I want to get into some more specifics. So um, I'd love for you to reflect on the conversation, what you've heard here, and how it might be the same or different than some of the other conversations you're hearing in your in your city and, and uh, your travels. Uh, I think the conversation has been spot on from a technical and policy perspective, uh, but the biggest missing piece in this work, and we're seeing this right now, uh, as we try to communicate the broad based benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act is we must, as leaders in this space, ground the work of addressing climate change and advancing climate and environmental justice and the everyday lived experiences of the residents and stakeholders uh, that we yeah. serve. And it's a big part of our responsibility as America's mayors to do just that. I think about what America's mayors did uh, when uh, former President Trump pulled out of the Paris Accords. It was America's mayors who stepped up to say, we want to meet our climate change goals at the local level and protect, protect our environment at the city level. And in Cleveland, uh, we have a storied history in this long battle and fight to address climate and environmental justice. You know, my predecessor was the first black mayor of a major American city, uh, Carl B. Stokes. And he didn't probably predict that he would be at the vanguard of this movement when in 1969, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. But he embraced the challenge. He did a nationwide pollution tour, crisscrossed the country, talked about the importance of America's cities protecting their environment. And because of his work and the work of many others across the country during that time, we passed the Clean Water Act and then passed the Environmental Protection Bill that allowed the EPA to be created. That work started in cities like Cleveland all across the nation. So as mayor of the great city of Cleveland, Ohio, and as chair of Climate Mayors, it is my responsibility to make sure we uplift the work that America's mayors are doing from my colleague in Atlanta, Mayor Dickens, who is taking a 14 acre green space park and making sure that it provides good housing and good transit and a part of the city of Atlanta that was historically redlined uh, in the 1950s to so the good work that our former chair of climate mayors, Mayor Rhodes Conway is doing, who just purchased 46 electric buses to really ensure that she's transforming public transit in her city. So America's mayors are doing the work and we are making sure we meet the moment once and for all. Well, that's I, I didn't know the story about the, the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga River and the yeah. mayor's role. Um, of course, that triggered the, as you as you mentioned, the Clean Water Act and the, even the EPA. Um, so there are these moments, right? And we're facing these moments right now. Um, yeah. Are your are your citizens and this is your citizens in Cleveland, as well as uh, being chair of the climate mayors. Um, what are they asking of their leaders? What are they asking of you? Well, I'll be very frank with you. Um, most Americans and most Clevelanders um, aren't asking me about the technical aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act. They're not asking me about the technical aspects of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. They're asking me about how can we do a better job uh, as city leaders to lower their energy costs. We in Cleveland, we have one of the most energy burdened cities in the country. They're asking me about clean water in our schools and our daycare centers. That's why I'm so happy that this president, our president, Joe Biden, helped us pass the bipartisan infrastructure law that has allowed us to remove lead pipes in thousands of daycare centers in Cleveland. And they're also asking about how do we make sure 
that as we decarbonize every aspect of our economy right now, we have to make sure that the benefits of the green economy are broad based, particularly in black and brown communities across this nation. And as a mayor of a majority black city, I have a special and a moral obligation to ensure we have a work, wages and wealth agenda as we talk about this green energy transition and transformation. Wow, so truly, truly systems piece and and very holistic. Um, we like we like we've heard throughout the program here. Um, I sense that uh, uh, we may have a couple other questions. Um, so from uh, from Valerie, perhaps, or from Anne um, for the mayor. I would be curious. Uh, we keep hearing this term innovation. And um, there's been lots of descriptions about what innovation um, is possible in describing and defining. Uh, what do you what do you think about innovation? How how do you think about it? Well, for me, it's it's how do we make um, the hard things simpler uh, for mm -hmm. our residents as we mm -hmm. think about this work. Uh, I, I'll give you a prime example. Uh, we have taken uh, $10 million of American Rescue Plan funds and put together a workforce development and jobs initiative, all mm -hmm. tied to making sure that yeah. underserved communities of color have the job training and access to the jobs that are being created because of this transition. And so we're working with our public schools and our local workforce development board to make sure we're training folks to weatherize homes in mm -hmm. all parts of our city. Uh, we're working with the union uh, to make sure the building trades are hiring people of color and young people to lay down broadband and fiber in mm -hmm. every part of our city. So it's all about connecting the dots. And in many ways, sometimes in the ivory tower, we get caught up in the innovative, fancy models mm -hmm. of, of making change and doing things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, as a mayor, it's my responsibility to figure out how do we get to yes and how do we make the hard things easier for our residents so they can achieve their God-given potential? And, and I want to speak to this very clearly. Uh, last year, we hosted a mayor's conference uh, as part of the climate mayor's convening, and a pollster gave us a deep dive and said this alarming fact, this time really in the June of June of last summer, that a large share of Americans had no idea what the Inflation Reduction Act was, a large share. <laughs> over 60%. But when you talked about the benefits of the bill, removing uh, lead pipes from our schools and daycare centers, lowering energy costs, put more money in your pocket uh, to start a business uh, or build a company, those things, those benefits resonated. And we, not just as elected officials, but us in this, on this Zoom chat here uh, this evening, we have to do a better job of communicating mm -hmm. what's at stake and how it helps everyday people. Yeah. Great. I wanted to ask. So, so then, what? So we're facing uh, some existential challenges. Yeah. Uh, Hank, can we lay this out? Um, this summer uh, will be um, likely the hottest on record, um, and uh, heat zones, vulnerable populations mm -hmm. um, in our nation's uh, cities as well as around the world. So. Um, what are what are you learning, or what do we need to do to communicate better, um, and to uh, communicate better to particularly that sixty percent that may not uh, have climate change on their radar? Well, um, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, I was just talking to the mayor of Tucson, Arizona, Mayor Gina Romero, and she's made a goal to plant a million trees to address uh, the heat issues in her respective city. That's one prime example. But we got to get back to brass tacks, knocking on doors, talking to folks, going to grocery stores, going to barber shops, going into our places of worship to talk about what we're doing and organizing around this work. And as we transition into a better, greener economy and a better, greener world, we have to build with people, not for people. We can't miss that point. Um, and so many times we make policy decisions in ivory towers and back rooms and city hall chambers without the residents at the table 
And so we have to challenge ourselves to center this work in their lived experiences and in their voices as well, too. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's that's uh, that's very powerful, and, and also picks up on on most of our conversation here. Um, what do you think if you were giving, and you, you touched on this already, but we brought up superpowers earlier. Yeah. Um, if you were going to, uh, for people tuned in here um, or people you're speaking to, um, what's your motivating superpower? What's the superpower that you are encouraging them to find? Uh, maybe they already know they have it or to discover and to apply it. I would say um, all of mayors across the country have this one distinct superpower. They are the closest to the problem so thereby, they are the closest to the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at everything happening across the country, especially some of the dysfunction we see in our, st in our state legislatures uh, and in Congress right now in Washington, it's going to be uh, cities that are going to lead the way. And cities mm -hmm. are going to be the reason why we meet our climate goals in the future and why we meet the moment for uh, the next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's uh, uh, again very powerful and and very much um, uh, to what um, uh, all of our panelists were talking about here. Um, what gives you, besides the the, the coalition of mayors um, and facing these grand challenges, um, what gives you the the greatest hope? And, and we've talked about youth. Um, we've talked of there are some some comments in the chat here about educating uh, young people, educate their parents. Um, what uh, what gives you the, the the greatest the greatest hope? Uh, particularly as, again, we're entering um, uh, uh, an inflection point? Well, I'm just inspired by uh, the young people in my city and really across the country who are now championing uh, this issue. Uh, they believe that addressing climate change is truly an existential crisis for our world. Um, and, and I believe they have the can-do spirit, the know-how, and the entrepreneurial acumen to really make sure uh, we meet the moment and right these historical wrongs. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have one of the best urban farms in the country in Cleveland. It's called the Riddell Farm, located in Cleveland's southeast side. Uh, historically, it was called the Forgotten Triangle, and it was a dumping site uh, that was a dumping site in a historically black neighborhood. So a group of uh, black leaders who were born and raised in that part of the city came together and started this farm. Now it's a national model of urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. And we just met in City Hall uh, yesterday talking about creating uh, one of our cities and really one of our state's first sustainable square miles to really be an example of what the green economy can do in a historically black marginalized uh, part of our city. And young people are at the table and residents are driving this innovation, driving the change. It's my job to support them and get out the way. And so uh, I think you see great examples of like that all across mm -hmm. the country. Amazing, amazing examples. Um, and so before we uh, before we wrap up, I want to uh, um, offer you each a chance to uh, 30 seconds or so to reflect on the conversation um, and uh, and maybe what you'll take away um, from uh, uh, tonight's town hall. And maybe we'll start with uh, start with Anne. Thanks. I think, you know, for me, the takeaway is, is um, there is so much common ground. Uh, we, we share a lot um, and uh, there's a lot of that shared optimism and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of hope in the youth. But I think we're still some of us who aren't as young are still here to share our wisdom and our experience as well. Right. Um, to try to implement some of their ideas. So um, to me, it's um, there's a, a we have all that we need. Now we just have to get to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Valerie. Yeah, uh, being um, maybe one of the last people to reflect on this, there were just so many um, wise and grounded things that were talked about this evening, and examples um, from across the world and. Um, I have to say that Mayor Bibb gave me a really different way to look at cities too. Um, and I also 
so critical to the conversation um, is justice and making sure these initi initiatives are working to uh, repair and restore um, equity and inclusion across our communities. In fact, that's where we should be beginning, um, including in the places that I work and that being in indigenous communities who are um, well known as amazing stewards of their lands and biodiversity across the globe. Great, thank you. And of course, climate justice is is a, is a big issue um, in the climate conversations. Um, and uh, Mayor Bibb. Well, I, I'm so happy uh, we talked a little bit tonight about climate justice and the hard work ahead. And I'd be remiss about it in reflecting the fact that we are in uh, the month of Black History Month. Mm -hmm. celebrating uh, black excellence because black history is American history. And one of my heroes is my late grandmother, uh, Sarah D. Presley, who died at the ripe young age of 93 years old mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago. And she was my first example of a climate activist because one of my first jobs was tending to the summer garden she created in a vacant lot on our block in the, in the inner city of Cleveland. Nice. And one thing she always told me was, well done is better than well said. Well done <laughs> is better than well said. If we live up to Grandma Sarah's words, uh, our nation and our world will be a lot better off for the present and for the next generation. I'll certainly take Grandma Sarah's words. Um, well done. Um, and uh, um, and also well done. We can all do our own, as uh, as Michael puts in the in the chat here. Just a simple idea of asking ourselves, uh, what do we need today? Uh, could I walk today instead of driving? Um, and reframing. Uh, it's not a big change, um, but it reframes our life and those around us. Um, so, really, Justin, Anne, and Valerie, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I really appreciate your comments and uh, um, and really the you know, the provocations here. Um, and uh, empowering um, those who are listening and, and those in our communities. Um, thank you all. Um, and we've really barely touched on our climate and water futures. Um, and I hope that we've left you with some answers and the spark to ask better questions and to uh, do well, uh, well done. And we've heard that many, we've heard of many of the solutions and that we have to change the mindset. And we've also talked about the different framings for innovation. Um, and uh, in a few moments, we'll close with a few more insights from the TED Explorers event. And we'll also have a survey. There's a survey in the, uh, in the, in the link in the resources page that we hope that you'll take because uh, we wanna hear from you. Uh, what's next? And I want to thank our guests, uh, David Bielo, uh, TED's lead science curator, and Hank Ovink, executive director of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. A little plug there, their report will be coming out this fall. Um, we'll reframing how we think about and value water. And Kurt Wolf, uh, the University of Michigan's director of urban collaboratory and co-lead on the Michigan Center for Freshwater Innovation. And Chelsea Shelley, Director of Research at the Center for Innovation and Sustainability and Resilience at Michigan Tech. And Valerie Gagnon, uh, Director of the University Indigenous Community Partnerships at the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Technological University. And Ann Bauman, Associate Director for Freshwater Future. And of course, uh, Mayor Justin Bibb, uh, Mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, and Chair of Climate Mayors. Of this event, it was made possible through a climate programming collaboration between PBS and Detroit Public Television. See, there you go, collaboration at work. Stay tuned for more town halls over the coming months as Great Lakes Now brings you more opportunities to participate in conversations about the most important issues affecting life in the Great Lakes and beyond. And special thanks to our co-hosts who are tuning in from near and far. Our co-hosts include, of course, Great Lakes Now and Circle of Blue and the University of Michigan Civil and Environmental Engineering Program, Michigan Tech's Department of Social Sciences, Freshwater Future, the Michigan Learning Channel, Detroit Public Television, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, WBGU in Bowling Green, Ohio, and PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, WPBS in Watertown, New York, WNMU in Marquette, Michigan, the City of Cleveland, Ohio, and Sustainable Cleveland. 
And thanks so much to the team at Detroit Public Television. It takes a lot to put these together. Scott Lehman, Anna Seisling, Jordan, uh, Jordan Wingrove, Colleen O'Donnell, uh, Myla Murray, and uh, Lona Contardi. And of course, Laura Hurd and Keith Schneider and Brett Walton here at Circle of Blue who helped make this possible. And the Great Lakes News Collaborative. There's Bridge, Michigan Public, Great Lakes Now, the Narwhal, and Circle of Blue. And again, thanks to our friends at TED and Detroit Public Television for creating the TED Explorers Climate Event. I'd encourage you to tune in. Uh, the link is in the, on the resource page. It's a great program, and you can visit that at greatlakesnow.org. And we'll uh, also, again, point you to that survey. And also point you to circleofblue.org for more coverage about water and climate from the Great Lakes to the world. And so what could our world look like? when we reach our climate goals. I think that was part of the framing here tonight. And what will it take to shape the future we want? Those are our questions to answer. And we'll close with these highlights from TED Explorers. Thanks so much for joining us and for all of us here and from Circle of Blue, I'm Jay Carl Ganter. What if we actually achieved our climate goals? What would that future even look like? They of course had a lot of thoughts. We'll let you pick your favorites. Thanks for watching. If we are successful in addressing the climate crisis, we massively reduce the vulnerability and improve the, the economic and the, the creative prospects of billions of people around the world who currently are basically excluded from all of the opportunities which we have, which come from having abundant material and energy all around us. That's the real prize. A world where we have had that exponential would be a world in which we have clean, cheap energy for all. At the end of this decade, the International Energy Agency believes that we will have enough capacity to be producing 10 billion, 10 billion batteries a year. It's enough for every person on the planet to have their own battery. I'm constantly surrounded by young people just like me uh, who are really, really, really passionate about the world that we live in for obvious reasons. It's the world that we will inherit. Women are very important for the energy transition. So if we're talking about a world where we have, you know, where we tackle climate change, all I want to see is, you know, women in power. I want to see more solutions being driven by young people. And I want our politicians to be truly and meaningfully engaged in making change. We always tend to underestimate the pace of ultimate adoption and change. Today there are more than 150 pathways, scientific pathways, that we could take to limit global warming. If we get to true net zero, astonishingly, global temperatures will stop going up with a lag time of as little as three to five years. We've been able to accelerate tree growth and carbon capture in tree stems by 30 to 70%. Offshore wind has the potential to cover the current electricity demand of the entire world, not once, not twice, 18 times. We need to decarbonize the old economy that we have and invest to create the new economy that we need. Regenerative farming is fairly simple in concept. It means creating the conditions for more life. We need to buy less stuff and we need to look after what we buy. Valuing the things that we own is a climate solution. We can all live in this transit-rich, carbon-negative, affordable way and leave the vast majority of the planet for nature, for agriculture, for clean oceans. We can do this. The ocean is a powerful source of solutions that we've overlooked for far too long. You have to be engaged. Let your elected officials know that this is important to you. You have to vote, you have to go out there and support politicians who are going to support our planet. We can create a legacy of environmental quality and climate resilience for all. You are not powerless. That the, oh, there's nothing we can't do, just keep going is symptom, not cure. That you are needed. The power of what we can do when it matters to us is unlimited. It's not that we're simply going to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, it's that we're going to improve the quality of life for humans, both in the urban and in the rural sector, and 
for non-humans. <laughs> 